So, Nick, who are the Draconis? The short slash long version, which I'll try to keep short, is that they are ultranationalist, neo-Marxist fanatics who emerged on Callisto, one of the moons of Jupiter, in the early 24th century, and then spread like wildfire. They're basically sort of like if the communist revolutions of the early 20th century were transplanted 400 years into the future and then spread across the world to the outer solar system. So what was going on in Callisto to make them form there? The economic situation on Callisto and Titan and Ganymede and a lot of these big worlds was very uneven. There were some very wealthy people and there was a lot of very poor people. So again, it's, it's a lot like the sort of you know, post-feudal situation you had like in, in pre-Soviet Russia in mm-hmm. say 1917. You have a lot of, you have a, a small number of people who are basically ruling like, basically ruling a fiefdom and you've got a lot of people who are doing all the work and not making any money. The literal meaning of the acronym is the, is the Revolutionary Division of the Assembly of Callisto. Now, the reason it's DRAC is because I render it in Portuguese. It's like Divisiao Revolucionaria Armada de Callisto or something like that. I can't. I, I don't speak Portuguese, but it's I'm. I use Portuguese as one of the lingua francas of the outer solar system because I'm anticipating that Brazil might play a role in future space settlement. But that's beside the point. So um, the Brazilians settled Callisto. Yes, the Brazilians were part of the, were were among the people who settled Callisto, and that's exactly how the revolution happened. Mm-hmm. Basically, this is the aftermath of a costly war. And they're sort of paying tribute to the victor powers in the solar system. But so I get that you've got an impoverished settlement that has uh, a lot of people that are probably demoralized from losing a war and they're getting all of the resources stripped. It's I mean, it's Germany in 1930. Yeah, that's what it it's sounds like. It. And, I, like, I like your. I actually really liked your 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 description you gave, which is paying tribute because that's basically what it is. Mars, which won the war, is extracting the resources, and then Ceres is basically using. Ceres is kind of like the uh, Switzerland of the solar system. They have all the money. They do all the banking. So, <laughs> with with Callisto, how many people are on Callisto? Callisto, oh, I'd have to do the backwards calculations, which I'm not going to waste your time with. Um, five million? Yeah, probably about that. Probably five to ten million around the time that this that this revolution is happening. Okay. Now, is it a big city with lots of settlements around it? What's going it's on? It's a number of big cities with smaller cities and settlements around them. Because the way I envision these worlds is they're not like Earth, where there's like... Yeah hundreds of thousands of big cities. It's a couple of really big metro- metropolitan areas and then lots of little settlements. So basically most of the people live in big cities and on a lot and a lot of them are like maybe 40% live in big cities and then the other 60% live in settlements. Okay. Now it, are these open air settlements? Can they breathe the oxygen on Callisto? Can uh, they breathe no. the air? They're 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 like domed and they're and they're in tunnels, stuff like that. It's kind of it's kind of like Mars, um, and except okay. more intense because Callisto actually does not have much of an atmosphere. Mars technically has somewhat of an atmosphere. Callisto has even less. Okay, so not only is it economically depressed and demoralized from losing a war, but also you're basically stuck inside. Yeah, and your whole life is spent inside. When was Callisto? Um, Settled by the 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 Brazilians. So Callisto was settled beginning in the 2090s. Yeah. Okay. I, again, I'd have to check my own notes because even I do lose track of some of these bits bits of data. But yeah, it's there. So it's like the 2090s and then through the early 22nd century. Okay. And so, when about was the revolution on Callisto then? The revolution we've been talking about is yeah. happens in the early 24th century. So that's about 200 years later. Okay. So they've been there about 200 years. So it's, it's again, your, your analogy of, um, you know, colonial America is, is, is not, is not, is not, is, or is apropos. 
Yeah. Because, you know, Americans had there been people in America for about 200 years by the time the American Revolution happened. Yeah. The revolution on Callisto, well, the Draconist Party or Draconist Front emerged mm. in 2317 and they okay. took power on Callisto in 2324. Okay. So it was like a seven year conflict, give or take. Well, no, it's because that, that's not the conflict. Well, but to take over Callisto. Yeah, to take over. It's it it it, it was it was it was a pretty quick ascent. But yeah, that's so, basically that's basically what happened. Is uh, the it was their beer hall push, right? There it, was yes the the you know Kristall not was in the or, uh, the night of broken glass where they were the Nazis were running the Jews off and and just harassing people and being fucking awful and burning books and and murdering innocent people, you know that the death camps weren't the next day, you know, um, you know, invading, you know, taking Paris didn't happen the next day, but the Nazis had to take power slow, you know, over, they kind of took power over Germany really over six or seven years. Yeah. You know, more than and, that, if you look at the actual history, because I think like the, the party that became the Nazi party was founded in like 1920. And they yeah. didn't take power until 1933. Yeah. So it was like 13 years. Yeah. Um, there's lots of weird history to that, which again, we don't necessarily need to get into because then it's, then it gets a little weird. Um, but we'll save it, that for another time. So, it's, it's important to know for the sake of making historical analogy. I think that's what you're doing. So again, I'm not, I'm not trying to say you're being weird, but yeah, that's what we're, that's why we're no, not at all. Not at all. Um, and so it's a seven year war to take Callisto. Mm -hmm. And so is there is there a Mao? Is there a Stalin? Is there a Lenin? Is there a Hitler here? I haven't thought that far ahead. There probably is. And there's probably a couple of them because there's not like I haven't thought of there being like a single unified leader. Um, there's you. It would make sense one. for there to be. At least there is a there is there is a figurehead person. Because like I told you off mic, revolutions don't happen when people are happy. Revolutions don't happen when bellies are full and the houses are warm. Revolutions happen when uh, everything's falling apart and you're kind of hopeless. Hopeless people join revolutions, you know, because a revolution means that the status quo stopped working for a large percentage of the population, which means, you know, as Americans, we should say, oh, how can we make the status quo work for everyone? But mm -hmm. that's a story for another time. Yeah. Um, so I would imagine on Callisto that there was a Lenin, there was a Mao, there was a Hitler. Yeah. You know, um, somebody, one singular voice, one singular person mm -hmm. that comes in and says you have been wronged and i can make it right for you join me because that's the promise of revolution right is a couple of things one all your problems not your fault two if you join me and do as i say we can fix it together we can get the bastards who did this to you the bastards are whoever the you know revolutionaries hate at the particular moment right mm -hmm. the bastards are the status quo and revolutionaries they look for disaffected just miserable people who the status quo isn't working for them and they've ruined their lives or maybe their lives were shit to begin with. But a vast, a big chunk of it is people who ruin their lives, right? Through alcohol, through drugs, through, you know, you, you just, your instability. They find unstable people and they exploit them. Mm -hmm. So I would say that the, the draconist on Callisto, they found a unstable place which is probably racked with violence and crime and drugs and booze 
full of pe- demoralized people who were unstable. And they said, if you join us, then we can kill the bastards who did this to you. Yep. And so over seven years, they take Callisto. What happens next? Do they go off world to fight or do, does, does the ICA come to them? That's right. It's, well, I say that's where it gets a little more complicated, which you probably anticipated. But, you know, the, the, the Jaconis taking power in Callisto is really just the beginning because that's where the actual Jovian civil war begins. Because when I say Jovian, I mean like the Jovian sphere of influence, Jovian being Jupiter. So there's obviously Callisto, but then there's a couple other big moons and there's like dozens of smaller moons, each of which in this timeline is it's, it's settled and has people living on it, doing things and just sort of living and doing work. So after they take power on Callisto, Callisto being a moon of Jupiter, right? Mm-hmm. Then they go to the other settled moons the of Jupiter and start conducting more revolutionary activities. Yes. To further expand their sphere of influence upset the status quo i'm guessing until that takes them to titan yes and eventually takes them to other sectors or sister planetary sectors within this within solar space which is the settled region of the solar system yeah. including saturn and then titan is the largest moon of saturn second largest moon in the solar system and even as they're still fight that's the thing even as they're still fighting to control the moon and jupiter because Part of what happens is for about six years, they, they just fight amongst themselves. The locals, the, the ICA basically blockades the Jupiter to Jovian system and says, we're not going to get involved except to keep the peace and to like safeguard, you know, commercial ships flying through. Eventually they get dragged in because there's actually a, a, a something that I have that's analogous to the 9-11 attacks, which is... Um, the Draconis carry out a bombing of the Edwin Aldrin Memorial Spaceport on Mars. Okay. Basically for the same reason that Al-Qaeda attacked 9 uh, uh, Basically for the same reason that Al-Qaeda attacked America in, 9, in the 9-11 attack, which is to draw the ICA into a war that they thought would break the ICA apart. Yeah. You know? They thought they could win the war. All it really ended up doing was causing a lot of a lot of bloodshed and getting a lot of people killed. And eventually, the Draconis were, were destroyed. But that's much further down the road. And um, so this takes us to the Mars Titan, not the Mars Titan War. This takes us to the Titan Civil War, because yep. you've got all the moons of Jupiter, and the revolution has spread through there, and then. The ICA is blockaded, much like how we sent carrier groups to the Middle East during the recent Israeli-Palestinian war Mm -hmm. to keep things from spreading out further than what they already were. Yep. And how does the revolution spread to Titan? Well, around the same time that the bombs were going off at the spaceport on Mars, the Draconis were sending their first cadres, you know, revolutionary organizers to Titan. And they started recruiting militias from all the disaffected, disgruntled, disenfranchised people on Titan that you talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. And eventually they got enough political oomph behind themselves that they were able to force in this new political party, which was called the United People's Party. It's kind of like, again, going back to the analogy of the Nazis. The Nazis entered power not just because they offered a a tantalizing alternative, but partially through strong arming because people were afraid of them. Um, they 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 got they got plenty of political momentum behind them. But they also use the they also use the stick, not just the carrot. And so, you go ahead. Let me ask you this. Let's talk about Titan now a little bit. Mm-hmm. How many people are on Titan at this time? A little more than Callisto. Callisto Titan has always been the second most populous world in the solar system after after Mars, and Callisto is the third most populous. So we can say somewhere between 15 and 30 million. 
Yeah, somewhere around that time, probably around 15 million, 15 to 20. 15 to 20 million. Okay. Yeah. So more cities, more population. Now, is this a world where people can breathe outside or are they in domes? They're, they're, they live in domes. The thing about Titan is it has a, it actually has a denser atmosphere than Earth. It's okay. just the atmosphere is not breathable and it's very cold. It's like negative 290 Celsius or something like that. So um, I think we're seeing a pattern where the Draconis seem to be successful is where they go to miserable fucking planets where no one can go outside, where the outside will fucking kill you. And... And that is, I mean, I mean, you look at seasonal affective disorder right here on Earth. Yeah. It fucks people up. P it's uh, fucking me up right now. Exactly. You ever go to Alaska? Oh, my God. It's sad there. It's sad there all the time because it gets dark at like noon. And <laughs> so if that happens here on Earth, we're like, oh, God, it's six o'clock. Life has no meaning anymore because it's dark outside. Imagine spending your whole life in a fucking tunnel. Going outside will kill you. You're stuck in this. Uh, you're stuck in this dome. So you're already like, as a human, we're biologically designed to be like outside at least a little bit, like at least the option. You know, it's nice to have the option, and these people don't have the option. So that's already gonna fuck them up. Yeah, they say it, if you want to go quote unquote outside i'm doing the fact of doing a little finger parentheses if you want to go outside you have to like simulate it in like a hollow deck type situation exactly and that's life support yeah that's not a life Chapter 1. New Galley, Mars, 2354. The night was cold and dark. Desert dust mingled with the air, forcing its way into your clothes and clinging to your hair, coating your skin, drowning your soul. The soul of Mars ran red with the blood of innocence, and on a night like tonight, there were always folks willing to spill a little more. Special Agent Janet Harkoff strode out of the night, scanning the street. She had close-cropped hair the color of sand and wore a stark frown that betrayed her impatience for bullshit. After taking in the scenery, her dark, tacturn eyes settled on a building to her right on the south side of the street. It bore a faded neon sign proclaiming antiques hanging over the door, which was turned off. Janet reached out and rang the doorbell. A muffled buzzing came from the inside. Following a long pause, the door creaked open. A weathered face appeared in the sliver of darkness, twisted into a scowl. Can't you see we're closed? The man said, nodding toward the dimmed open sign. As he swung the door shut, Janet caught it with her right hand and said, I'm going to have to insist. The man's scowl returned. Look, if you're going to cause a scene, then I'm going to have to call the... Janet deftly withdrew her ID wallet with her free hand and flipped it open. It displayed a silver shield in the stylized letters A-L-C-A, along with her agent's credentials. The name Harkoff, comma, Janet E. stood out in a well-defined black letters next to the stern-faced ID photo. Don't bother, she said in a voice like polished granite. Someone went to the trouble already. That's why I'm here. This is an official ALCA investigation. Ignoring the man sputtering, she forced the door open and pushed in past him, returning her credentials deftly to her pocket as she did. She looked around, taking in the interior of the store. The tables were weighed down with cellular phones, dusty circuit board computers, and video disc players, most centuries old. She grinned as she took in the scenery. 
telling him this sure is a nice setup you've got here. She picked up a wind-up toy monkey off a display table, having only seen one before in vintage movies. She was half tempted to wind up the little piece of history and just see it clang away. But instead, she continued telling the old man the anonymous tip we received told us she might be trafficking livelier trinkets than this. She placed the monkey down and turned to face him, neatly crossing her arms, her eyes boring into his, telling him the artificial kind, that is. The old man licked his lips. Unable to keep her gaze for long, he smiled, showing several crooked teeth. The expression was clearly forced. He couldn't even bring himself to deny it. Janet smiled faintly, understanding. She turned on her heel, scanning the room in a business-like manner. She spotted a door along the back wall of the main room with a faded employees-only sign tacked onto it. She stepped toward the door. I'll just look around for myself then. I'm sure you won't mind. As she neared the door, the old man rushed to intercept her. He had found his confidence again. No. I'm afraid that is out of the question. I'm sorry you came all this way here for nothing. He put a commanding hand on her shoulder, telling her, I'll show you the door. Janet turned her head and disdainfully looked at his hand. The look on her face would have told a wiser man what kind of danger he was in. Then her placid smile returned. I think I'll stay here, thanks. She opened the back room door and stepped through. She paid no mind to the old man's protest, finding herself awash in a dizzying array of old tech knickknacks, layer upon layer in baskets that were stacked on shelves, almost scraping the three-meter ceiling. She strode down the center aisle and rounded a corner, her right hand instinctively reaching for the left side of her jacket. The old man kept pace behind her. He was shouting now. Now listen here. This is my establishment, and I have a right to privacy. You have yet to produce a warrant, and I will not allow... Janet wheeled on him, one finger raised, dangerously. As a matter of fact, you have no such rights. Article 18, subsections 4 through 9 of the Harrison Accord state that I can search the premises for contraband of the artificial sort without any need of a warrant or prior alert of said search. That means if you get in my way, your right to privacy isn't the only right you'll be forfeiting tonight. As she spoke... Someone came around the corner, a tall, athletic man who looked to be about 20, wearing pristine blue coveralls and carrying a bundle of spare parts. He had dark hair and tanned olive skin. The stranger said nothing, staring at Janet with widened eyes that broadcast an intense, uneasy tension. The old man stepped up next to Janet and continued his protest. Yes, he is my assistant, he sputtered putting himself between Janet and the other man. He's been here almost a year now. Janet shot a glance at the old man and then turned to the stranger again and put her hand on her hip. So what's the story? She pointed to the coveralls with her other hand. Those are pretty clean for someone who's been working in an antique electronics shop for a year. He said nothing, still glaring at her. She stared straight back, slowly moving her hand towards the holster. Show me your wrist, pal. And then, quicker than Janet could whip out her pistol, he exploded to life. He threw the bundle of spare parts at Janet and then charged her, almost bowling her over as he made for the rear exit. Stop! The old man shouted as the runner reached the door. They'll kill you if you run! Janet shoved him aside, pistol drawn. She practically leapt out of the rear door and down the stoop after him, only to find the suspect had vanished. Shit! She yelled. Then she pressed a button on her wrist-mounted data device. Zero, are you there? I'm at the back exit of the old antique shop. Get the local Marseg precinct on the line. There's an old man inside who was sheltering the suspect. Have the local operatives book him when they arrive. I'm going after the goddamn Zarki. Do you have a visual on where it's headed? Not waiting for a response, Janet took off down the rear of the storefront, then rounded the corner into an alley leading back to the main street. She scanned for movement, then took off again. When she reached the street, it was more crowded than before. Late night revelers were gathering, wandering about the streets in search of one more drink before last call. Soon the Union Day celebrations would be starting. 
Zero's voice returned a moment later. Harkov, I got it. It's headed south, down the street, just ahead of you. Janet swiveled, craning her neck for the sign of her target. Its dark coveralls were like a spotlight against the bright outfits of the civvies. Janet pursued, the skyline looming ahead of her like dark glittering mountains. Reaching the crowd of revelers, she waved her badge over her head. Get out of the way, she shouted. ALCA, let me through. The dumbfounded people parted like pages of a book, allowing her enough space to continue forward. A sloppy drunk and a tattered day-glow smoking jacket grabbed her ass as she pressed past him and got a broken hand in return. She pressed through more crowds of people, her eyes still straining to catch a glimpse of the running man in blue coveralls. There. She saw her target ducking through a crowd further down the street. Shoving through a cluster of civilians, Janet tore off again after her quarry. This was where she was in her element. Hunting hostels, just like the old days. Just like Titan, she thought, grinning. A crackly voice sounded in the bud in her left ear. Harkov, I've got your location. Bad guy's on the next street over. She pressed two fingers of her left hand to the side of her neck, activating the subdermal microphone located there. I'm going to try to force the thing into a corner. See if you can find me a dead end somewhere. After a breath. She went on. It's already bolted once. I'm legal to retire on sight. With that, she burst ahead at full tilt, almost knocking down an old man with a much younger woman on his arm, both of whom barely just got out of her way as she barreled past. The street ahead reached a four-way junction with an antique wrought iron fountain near the center. A going-away party outside the fountain had merged with three bachelor parties. All four groups had conglomerated into a raucous tornado of self-destruction. Janet didn't concern herself with any of this. All she cared about was the cover the crowd provided for an artificial on the run, already all but indistinguishable from the humans around it. It was further ahead now, and rapidly gaining distance. Now it was time for desperate measures. She pointed her weapon up at the sky. Everyone get down, she shouted, and then she squeezed the trigger. Dozens of people reflexively ducked or threw themselves to the ground at the sound of the shot. As it echoed off the buildings throughout the square, she clearly saw her target. It was the only one in sight who failed to duck at the sound of the gunshot. It was now turning down one of the side streets, heading directly for a blind alley. Janet leapt down the pedestal and took off again. She activated the subdermal mic. Zero, get the local precinct down here. Tell them to be ready for crowd control. And tell the agency to bring a tag and bag team for when I'm done with this piece of shit. In her ear, Zero's voice crackled. I thought you were going to take this one alive. Janet ignored him. She had made up her mind. The ones that caused trouble could spread funny ideas. For Janet's money, it was better to cut off the head of the snake before it got too big to wrangle. Up ahead, Janet could see the Zarn reach the dead end. It didn't miss a beat. Turning on its heel and aiming to take off past her before she made up her mind to shoot. That's why you never give them a chance, Janet thought bitterly. She'd seen it gone wrong so many times. She wasn't about to make that mistake again. Luckily, the wayward Zorn had taken a wrong turn down a dead end. Janet caught up to her target and came to a quick halt a half dozen paces away. She raised her pistol and aimed it at the artificial, now swiveling its head in search of an escape. End of the line, she said firmly. Put your hands on your head and get on your knees now. She tightened her grip on the weapon. It had run, which meant she was within her rights to kill it. All she needed, all she wanted, was a reason. All she had to do was wait. Wait.